Often, when I go places, I'm introduced uh, as the direct, former director of policy planning or former dean. When I go anywhere, conferences that are about age 35 and under, I introduce myself as I was Jared Cohen's boss. <laughs> Far more <laughs> important credential. Uh, I think that just gives you a measure uh, of uh, how well known Jared is in the new tech world. Uh, he is really a phenomenon. Uh, I met him when I, came, when I became director of policy planning. He was the youngest member ever of the policy planning staff. He was hired uh, by uh, Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice. Uh, she had uh, taught him at Stanford, uh, but uh, he, he had then gone on uh, to win a Rhodes Scholarship. While he was at Oxford, he really wasn't at Oxford. He was uh, in Iran for a number of months. He was in Iraq. He was in Afghanistan. He was in Syria. And once he finagled his way into the Democratic Republic of the Congo by hiding under a pile of bananas in a truck. This is not your usual Rhodes Scholar experience, and it, I have met his parents. It's remarkable to me how calm they are. Uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, after his experience uh, at uh, Oxford, he actually wrote uh, his first book, 100 Days of Silence, uh, America and the Rwandan Genocide. He's since written a subsequent book that I strongly recommend, and particularly now, given what's happening in the Middle East, Children of Jihad, uh, A Young American's Travels uh, Among the Youth of the Middle East. So given that the youth of the Middle East are now reshaping the geopolitical map, I strongly recommend the book. Uh, Jared didn't just travel in these countries. He basically interviewed every violent extremist he could meet. Uh, he has met with members of al-Qaeda, members with lots of offshoots, uh, people in the Taliban, uh, people in Africa, and in the State Department, he did very important work on countering violent extremism, uh, moving not from the counter, t focusing not on the counterterrorism part, but more on the shaping attitudes, reaching young people before they could be recruited. That focus naturally led him to a technology focus, and what he did uh, while I was director of policy planning was really to launch what we call 21st century statecraft, using technology to engage a wide range of participants in foreign policy, from CEOs of tech companies uh, to public-private partnerships of all different kinds, to outreach to Muslim communities, to youth, to women, uh, and other demographics. He left us, notwithstanding uh, many pleas, I think the Secretary herself tried to keep him uh, at the State Department, but he went on to found Google Ideas uh, with Princeton alum Eric Schmidt, uh, who actually he met through a, a technology delegation uh, going to Iraq. Uh, Google Ideas is a think-do tank meaning that they, it produces wonderful ideas, but it doesn't just write policy papers and reports, it actually funds, incubates, uh, and gets ideas off the ground, translating wonderful ideas into action. Most recently, he has co-authored a book uh, with Eric Schmidt on the future of technology. It doesn't yet have a title, but I think you may hear some of the ideas in it in his talk today. Uh, I predict it will be a blockbuster, and please join me in welcoming Jared Cohen to Princeton. Well, thank you uh, very much, Anne-Marie. I, I can't tell you guys how fun it is to actually get introduced by Anne-Marie, uh, and it's, uh, I mean, it's truly a treat. She was one of my absolute favorite people in my entire life that I'll ever work with, and so uh, I'm jealous of all of you that you actually get to interact with her every day here, whereas I'm, I'm still sending emails and tweeting at her and, and so forth. Um, but it's also a privilege for me to be here at, at, at Princeton. I, I've actually never spoken at the university uh, before, and I've uh, only been here a few times, and so uh, I jumped at the chance to, to come here and engage with all of you. 
Um, it still sometimes makes me laugh a little bit when um, I'm asked to speak about the intersection of technology and foreign policy or technology and international relations, mainly because I, I arrived pretty late to the, to the topic and I arrived at the topic and sort of embraced this passion largely by accident and because of sort of bad research methodology. Um, and so I'm going to get to that in a middle, in, in a little bit, but I wanted to just sort of throw a few thoughts out to, to frame what I'm going to talk about today. Um, to me, in the future, you can't understand international relations without also understanding technology and where it's going. That intersection is only going to become more profound going forward, um, and the relevance of technology to every single challenge we face for good or for ill um, is only going to become more significant in every aspect of, of, of our lives. And to give you an idea of sort of where we've come in the last 10 years, if we look at mobile and internet statistics, 10 years ago, there were only 361 million people that were connected to the internet. That number is now way over 2 billion people. 10 years ago, there were only 907 million people who were using mobile phones around the world. Uh, that number is well over 5 billion now. Um, the, the growth is extraordinary. And one of my favorite examples to, to pull out and highlight is Pakistan which is a country that obviously is of tremendous geopolitical importance. It's a real hot spot. There's tremendous uncertainty. 10 years ago, there were only 300,000 mobile phone subscriptions in Pakistan. Um, does anyone want to guess how many there are today, a country of 167 million people? Just, just shout it out. 20 million, 70 million, I heard 30 million. Uh, over 105 million. So that growth is just extraordinary. Right? And this isn't growth in California, this isn't growth in you know, New York, it's not Western Europe, this is Pakistan, which is in the news every single day, in large part because of the uncertainty that, that, that we see there and because of its geopolitical significance in the realm of, of national security. Um, but the reason that I also like to sort of uh, pull out those statistics is because we often now hear this term, in the future everybody's going to be connected. You know, we sort of throw that around, but we don't really necessarily appreciate what that means, which is you're going to have another 5 billion people online in the, next, in the next 10 years. There's going to be more people online than currently exist in the world today, and there's going to be more online identities in the world than currently exist today because everybody's going to kind of have their own virtual entourage and proliferate you know, various identities of themselves for various purposes. Um, and what's interesting is most of the people coming online in the future are going to be coming online in parts of the world that are ridden with the greatest number of socioeconomic and security challenges in the world. And so we have to understand technology and where it's going in order to understand how people in these communities will adapt, be impacted by, um, and be influenced by these tools that are coming in uh, to, to, to various places around the world. So I say that to, to frame this, and then I'm going to take you through my own sort of personal journey on this, because I think it is important to understand how one accidentally stumbles into something that seems so complex. Talk about some of the challenges along the way, and then uh, discuss a little bit uh, about where I think this is, this is all going. Um, and to do, to do that, let me take you back to, 2000, uh, to, to 2004. Um, I was a... Uh, a uh, graduate student uh, at the time, and as Anne-Marie mentioned, I didn't spend a lot of time uh, in class. And I, I spent a lot of time initially in Iran. All I wanted to do was go to Iran uh, for a pretty simple, reasonably naive reason, which is it seemed pretty important and I didn't know very much about it. So I sort of hesitated to be honest about my methodological approach to the research project I did there because I'm standing in a room with, with academics, but I wanted to interview opposition leaders and reformists and dissidents, and I just hadn't really prepared very much. And so I had this long list of people, uh, some of which were dead, um, some of who were sort of listed multiple times under different names. It was just like a really badly scrapped together research project, but I just wanted an excuse to go to Iran. And so I applied for a visa five times through the embassy in London. Finally got a visa 12 hours before I got on the plane because I had convinced them that I was studying anthropology and I wanted to go visit to study the glorious sort of era of Persepolis and Prosergat. Um, and so as a sort of fake anthropological student, I hopped on a plane and, 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 and went to Iran. Um, now, not long after arriving there, uh, I found myself in a little bit of trouble with the Revolutionary Guards and the secret police who found a, that list that I mentioned that I had sort of concocted to, to figure out who I wanted to interview. And so it's a really big problem when you're in the Islamic Republic of Iran and they find a list of journalists, of, of dissidents that you want to interview and you're there on a tourist visa to sort of look at anthropological sites. Like, it just doesn't look good. Um, and so every, 
everything that we've seen since then sort of reinforces the idea that that was probably a very stupid idea. Um, and anyway, they, uh, I remember they took me uh, uh, to this room at sort of a weird hour of the night and you know, they started asking me what I was doing there. Um, and I'll never forget this guy. His, uh, I think his name was Mr. Salahi and he was huge. Um, and he came in and slammed the door shut and said, you know, what are you doing? You know, you're going to end up in, in prison. We know why you're really here. You work for these people. You work for those people. And then slammed the door shut. And 20 minutes later, he comes back, you know, his top button's unbuttoned. He's sort of smiling, has some tea and coffee and some, you know, biscuits. And, you know, says to me, oh, is this your first time in Iran? You know, we, we want to make sure you really enjoy it. He puts some tourist brochures out on the table. And this just sort of went back and forth for a while, and I was very confused. Um, anyway, long story short, he ended up, it, it, it was largely mean and sort of less nice in the game of mind tricks. Um, but uh, my research was completely shot. I was very upset. Yeah, I was pretty young. I was, I was, I think, 22 at, at, at the time. And here I was spending you know, my you know, first post-Stanford New Year's Eve in the Islamic Republic of Iran with intelligence people being really mean to me and no friends. And so what do you do in that situation? You wander around the country looking for friends. Your research is shot. Um, it's going to be impossible to do what you want to do. And so I started sort of going into some of the, the universities. And I had remembered a very sort of nifty trick when I was you know, under 21, where you know, if you had sort of a, a fake ID, you would talk on the phone at the same time as giving the bouncer your fake ID, and you sort of seemed more credible. And so I did that to sneak into some of the universities. Um, and when I got to the universities, uh, a couple extraordinary things happened. Um, one, the, the first group of students that surrounded me, um, they found that I was from the United States, and they had like one burning question that they were dying to ask me, which is, is it dangerous to be a baby in the United States? And in particular, they wanted to know if it was dangerous to be a baby in Beverly Hills, California. And this is very perplexing to me. And so I, I asked them to explain a little bit more. And it turned out at the time there were a series of high-profile kidnappings in Beverly Hills, California. And the Iranian media had sort of spun this as, don't go to Iran, your baby will get, or go to the US, your baby will get snatched. It's a dangerous place to be an infant. It's terrible, all these things. And here I was in my head sort of thinking, this is just unbelievably crazy. And then I thought back to all the things that sort of you know, various you know, people in a not so politically correct way said to me before I went to Iran. Don't go there. They're all terrorists. You're going to get killed. You know, all these things are going to happen. Now, this was an important moment because you know, I sort of realized the misperceptions on both sides. And I realized that you know, there is this sort of common denominator between them being young and me being young. And so I started hanging out with them. And they started, you know, I started going to other universities. Um, still nothing to do with technology here, but uh, what I found is that it was really fun to you know, lose my minders during the day and sneak out at night with all the young people and go to these sort of you know, fun parties. And sort of, uh, you know, one thing that, that really sort of changed how I, how I thought about things, though, was when I was in the southern city of Shiraz. And this is where technology starts to come into it. And there was a very busy uh, sort of market, sort of what you see here in, in, in Iran, they, they, they call it a bazaar. Um, and uh, in the midst of the, the, the uh, one of the intersections, I saw something unbelievably crazy, which is you know, all of these like, dozens of young people perching up against the walls of different shops, just tapping away on their mobile devices. And so I, I asked some of them, what are you doing? And one of them said, oh, I'm recruiting a bassist for my band. Another one was picking up, you know, he's trying to get a date. A couple of them were trying to organize parties. You know, they, were just, they weren't doing anything really substantive, but it just sort of seemed strange to me. I said, well, how, how are you doing this? They said, oh, we're using Bluetooth. And so I asked one of them, and, and I, I, I tell this story in every time I speak because it, defi it literally it had the greatest impact on how I see the world still to this day. Um, I had thought when they said Bluetooth that you know, maybe they think of Bluetooth as something different because I think of it as you know, that weird device where you walk around talking to yourself or the thing that allows you to talk and drive at the same time. And they said, no, no, let, let us show you. And one of them you know, sort of pulled up his phone and a whole bunch of names showed up. It was like Tupac for life and like a bunch of other things that, that you know, are not worth repeating. Um, but they were literally using it to call and text complete strangers. So what I hadn't realized is that Bluetooth, as I knew it, was a peer-to-peer -peer device that uh, allowed my phone to talk to my earpiece without having to go um, through a tower. Um, but it could also be used to call and text complete strangers. Um, and that's what Iranians were, were, were doing. They were literally like club promoters out there calling and texting complete strangers who, as long as they were within you know, 30 or 40 feet, they could send a message to. And they're all sort of looking around, you know, trying to sort of identify who's messaging them or, or calling them or, or, or texting them. And so at this point, they're all gathered around me. And I said, well, this seems very illegal, what you're doing. And yet you're doing it out in the open. You know, aren't you worried about getting caught? 
And they sort of laughed and they said, oh, nobody in Iran over 30 knows what Bluetooth is. <laughs> and so it, it, it summed up this really interesting generation gap that existed between you know, the first generation of Iranians who were being brought up with high prevalence of these tools and an older generation that really doesn't know how to use them. And so I was pretty ex excited about the, this, this, uh, this innovation you know, sort of gap that, that, that I noticed. And when I came back to the United States, a couple things happened. One, I talked to some of the companies that had been at the forefront of developing Bluetooth technology, and they understood from a technical standpoint how that was possible, but they couldn't for the life of them figure out why anybody would want to do that. They, 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 I, I repeatedly heard the word sort of, isn't that a really weird thing to do? You know, like, why wouldn't you just go talk to them? And you know what? Western companies developing technology to solve for the problems of Western societies don't understand is you, know, you throw those tools into you know, some of the most challenged environments in the world, ones that are repressive, ones where you know, people don't have a lot of means to assemble freely or speak, free, speak freely, and all of a sudden the handset takes on a much more meaningful, uh, important, uh, it becomes much more important. And so you know, even the smartest engineers in the entire world you know, trying to solve the problem of how do you talk and drive at the same time, even they cannot imagine how necessity will drive innovation in some of these environments. And that innovation gap will always exist. Wherever you have challenges, people will use technology in more innovative ways than very smart engineers and societies uh, or citizens and societies that don't have those challenges. I, th I bet I can illustrate that with one question to all of you, which is everyone here has a mobile device. By show of hands, how many of you have ever read the instructions manual to it? I see only the sort of you know reasonably young members of the of, of, of the audience, um, and and why would you? You have freedom of speech, freedom of assembly. Your handset is just a tool to facilitate basic civil liberties and freedoms that you already have. Um, but if you're living in a place like Iran, that handset is a tool that connects you to civil liberties that you may not otherwise have. Uh, now it's not you know a, it's an imperfect solution, but it is one of the few assets that you actually have. Now the second challenge I had was when I was sort of running around Washington, briefly people and talking to people on my trip to Iran. So I, I pulled up this picture here of, of a sort of typical party in, in Tehran. And this isn't just the rich. You go to, the, I found that the sort of uh, more economically downtrodden the slum or the part of a city that you went to a party in, the more outrageous it was. I mean, I've just never seen anything as outrageous as the nightlife underground in Iran. It's like, you could write books on this. Uh, maybe one of you has, I don't know. Um, but I, get, I got a lot of the same reactions from people in Washington, which is, who cares that these young people are using Bluetooth to you know, organize parties where they drink alcohol that they make in bathtubs and sinks or to organize drag racing down long streets? And I said, no, 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 forget about sort of where they're going and what they're doing and look at the tactics. These young people, and remember this is 2004, 2005, these young people are using technology in ways that the engineers in the West who designed them never imagined to organize to do things that they're not allowed to do by law or by norm. That's what they're, they're literally self-training in civil society activism without even realizing it. And so for today, it, you know, today it's parties, but tomorrow imagine what it'll be. That was sort of my message uh, back then. And you know, it, it, it sort of, it seemed like a still pretty foreign concept because you didn't have a proof of concept for it. Um, now fast forward to June of 2009, um, the Iranian government shut down the networks. Um, they shut down SMS, they shut down the internet. Um, one of the most popular ways for people in close proximity to share content and communicate with each other was that funny little technology that they had been using in 2004 and 2005, and subsequently, Bluetooth. Um, and so they knew how to use it right away. It was sort of natural to them. They used it every day anyway. Now, this wasn't a game changer in Iran, but it was a sort of moment of resilience. It was you know, the innovative use cases of these young people serving as at least a small backup to some of the technical challenges they had in a moment of shutdown. Now, what, I'll come back to, to, to this a little bit later, but uh, the, the Green Revolution in more detail, but I do want to sort of continue the narrative. Um, Everyone knows what this video is, if not by show of hands. So I know. And for those of you whose hands are, are not early days of the Green Revolution, there was a young girl named Nada Sultan who was killed on the streets of Tehran, and it was captured on uh, video and, and sort of you know, spread virally throughout the world. Now, what's interesting is when the Green Revolution happened, 
you know, the official policy of the Obama administration was there will be no meddling in Iran. So it's very clear, and Anne Marie knows this because I sort of allegedly meddled by accident. Um, but we'll, we'll, we'll come to that. We'll come to that later. Um, but what's interesting about this video is not sort of the call to Twitter or any of that stuff that you may see reported. What's interesting about this video is. We don't know who captured it. I don't know if they were male, female, rich, poor, a political bystander, a, a, a political activist, or an innocent bystander who was just there. We have no idea, and I know that because when I was at uh, State Department, we tried to find out who posted this video originally, where, where it came. We, we couldn't find out. Even, even, even the sort of you know the, the company that had built the platform didn't know. There, there's no way uh, to, to identify that particular individual. Now, what's interesting about this is the video spread like wildfire. Um, rapidly, and within hours, that video was not just all over the world, but it was on the desks of some of the most powerful and least accessible people on the planet. Presidents, prime ministers, heads of state, senior officials in government. And not only was that video on their computer screens in their versions of the Oval Office, but they had no choice but to watch it. And they had no choice to, but to watch it because when they got asked the question, have you heard of the video or seen the video, they could not credibly say no without looking callous or looking out of touch. And so that unknown person in Iran essentially got a virtual meeting um, with President Obama, President Sarkozy, the Prime Minister of the UK, leaders all around the world um, in a matter of hours. And that's exactly what happened. The President of the United States was asked if he'd seen the video in a White House press conference. And he went on a whole riff about how uh, the regime is you know, uh, committing horrific violent, uh, violence against its people. And fundamentally, his change in rhetoric marked a change in US foreign policy towards Iran. So this is remarkable. Now take, you know, for all these people that like to say technology didn't matter, yes, the revolution in Iran you know, did not end up being successful uh, in the immediate aftermath for Iranians and subsequently has not been successful for Iranians. But to say that technology did not play a role uh, sort of is troublesome to me because take mobile phones out of the equation in Iran um, and ask yourself whether or not had this girl been killed on the streets of Tehran, whether or not in a matter of hours that could have changed the policy of the most powerful leader of the free world, President Obama. And I, I think it's hard to argue that it, it would have. You, know, you would have had NGOs and activists trying to describe what happened. They maybe even had a picture of what happened, but there was something about that video um, and that young girl dying uh, in a matter of seconds before the entire world uh, that was so powerful and so different from anything that people had seen in close to real time uh, that, 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 that it, it, it was game changing. Um, now, the other piece of this um, is people often sort of ask the question, you know, the, the other sort of criticism of this that I'll come back to is, you know, wasn't the Green Revolution ultimately, uh, ultimately a failure? Um, and so hold that thought. I'm going to come back to that in my discussion of, of the Arab Spring. Um, now, I think it's important in understanding, you know, sort of 21st century statecraft, understanding the intersection of technology and international relations, um, to sort of look back even before the Green Revolution, which was the sort of most visible in this you know, latest uh, string of, of, of case studies that we've seen, and look at some of the early examples that are less known. Um, I was fortunate to get to work in policy planning, um, both in the Bush administration and the Obama administration, and sort of see how two different administrations at two very different times in uh, the prevalence of technology were sort of grappling with these issues. Um, now, the first, to me, really big example in the sort of universe of connection technologies, which is, you know, tools that connect people to uh, information, each other, and, and actual resources, came on February 4th, 2008, um, when uh, 12 million people in 190 cities around the world protested against a 40-plus-year-old terrorist organization called the FARC. Um, and I won't go into too much detail about this, but long story short, uh, social networks were, 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 were used to get people in the streets in a way had it never happened before. I had the opportunity to meet some of the online activists who had no office or anything, uh, had never met a government official before uh, in person down in Colombia. Um, and I was so compelled by what they told me uh, that I convinced uh, some other government folks to go down there uh, with me a few months later. And we met with then president of Colombia, Alvaro Uribe. And we sat with him in the aftermath of these demonstrations and we asked him how game changing were social networks? Because again, the skeptics were out. You know, technology had no role in this. That's just sort of fluff. And so we figured, let's, let's go to the source. Um, now, what you have to understand is the two weeks following these massive protests saw the largest number of demobilizations and desertions from the FARC in its 40 plus year history. So it's not like these protests were, 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 were insignificant. The, the impact was very real. And so 
his explanation for why they were not only of high impact, but they were essential is the following. He said all these years that he and others have been trying to fight against the FARC, um, nobody could ever organize anything because they were always tied to where they got money, they were tied to the sort of political leanings of their organization. He said, because this whole thing was organized online, you couldn't Google anybody. You know, there, there was, there, nobody knew who any of these people were, um, so you couldn't tie them to money. They had no political leanings. There was no online, they had no online presence. And it all happened so fast that nobody could make any sense of it. And he said, as a result, their message was so simple, no more killing, no more kidnapping, no more FARC, that it was simple enough for people to credibly get out around those three oppositions to these extremist groups. And by getting all those people out in the street, it sparked all these demobilizations. Now, I only learned later why that happened. In talking to demobilized members of the FARC, I asked them why they demobilized. And I met several who had demobilized only a couple, uh, a couple weeks before I got there. And they said, all these years, we thought we were on the winning side. And then we heard on the radio how all these people were in the streets against us, and we realized that we weren't winning anymore. And so the other side sounded better, and we didn't really know what the cause was anymore. It was that, it was, it was that simple in some cases. Um, and uh, the other point that President Uribe mentioned, which is very important, because the online piece of this is only one component, he mentioned that when all these natural desertions and demobilizations happened, it gave the government of Colombia the green light it needed to really step up its media, it, it, its military operations and deal one final devastating blow to the FARC. So these sort of unlikely leaders came together to, you know, basically do a large flash mob around the world. That sparked a lot of demobilizations that threw the FARC off in ways that they hadn't been in, in decades. And then the Colombian military came in and, and, and finished the job. This is a very compelling story and in a very important context for the Bush administration, who was very, very focused on FARC in Colombia. Nothing else of major significance happened in the Bush administration. You had you know, Uyghur protests in China, you had some small skirmishes in Guatemala, but nothing, no other success stories. And then, you know, sort of time out on the, on the administration. And the Obama administration came into office in large part because of what technology was able to do and the swell it was able to create around uh, you know, community organizing to get the president elected. Um, it wasn't a natural transition because that's politics and this is foreign policy and, 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 and you know, international security. And so the two aren't naturally blended as much as, as, as one might think. Um, but a couple things happened early on um, in, uh, the, uh, in the Obama administration. One, um, and I'm not just saying this because Amory's here. Amory was there on day one pushing this agenda, which you know, was the sort of natural evolution of all the work that she'd done on networks and uh, was sort of in the secretary's office every day, sort of planting the seed and getting her bought into this. And, 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 and it took time, but there had never been that kind of top level um, sort of advocacy for, for these issues before with such, with such frequency. Um, then on, uh, in, in, in April of 2009, right before the Green Revolution, you had this sort of, quote, Twitter revolution in Moldova, which wasn't really a Twitter revolution, but a revolution where some people use Twitter. And it was sort of a fascination. It got emailed around a little bit, but as I told a number of students earlier today, you know, Moldova doesn't really get people excited in the sort of universe of national security priorities. And so it sort of came and went and was fascinating for those of us that, that kind of watched the, these issues. Um, and then, you know, of course, came the Green Revolution in Iran, which I discussed. But of course, the problem is, you know, three weeks into the Green Revolution, um, it, it, it ended. And it ended abruptly, and it ended badly. And a lot of the technologies that were used for proxy and circumvention ended up sort of getting people in trouble afterwards. People went back through the tapes, and dissidents got arrested. It was, it was, it was not a good aftermath. Um, and so there still wasn't this sort of, you know, uh, additional case study. And at a certain point, Columbia had happened in 2008, you know, we're now into sort of, you know, middle, late 2009, and people are saying, you know, there's more failures than there are successes. You know, there's more examples of technology being irrelevant to everything, um, you know, geopolitically than there are technology being relevant to, 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 to a lot of these movements. And this was very frustrating for those of us that were trying to push this. And then something even worse happened, which was WikiLeaks. Um, and this couldn't have come at sort of a, a worse time for people who were trying to push internet freedom, who were trying to sort of push integrating technology into the foreign policy toolkit for efforts that were broader than just communicating and advocating our policy, but also about empowering citizens in environments around the world. And, you know, people just sort of latched onto this. Um, you know, I left uh, not, long, not long after this, totally unrelated, by the way, uh, my, my four years in government uh, were, were, were done. Um, 
But then the, the, the next sort of round of this came, which was the Arab Spring. Um, now, before I even talk about Tunisia or Egypt or Libya or Yemen or any of these other countries, let me make an observation. And I believe this very, very strongly, having spent time in every single country in the Middle East and North Africa, except for Oman, which I hope to visit one day. Um, people talk about the Green Revolution as a failure. And I do believe the Green Revolution failed locally in Iran, right? They were protesting against the election results, but the elections didn't really matter that much anyway, given how Iran, uh, Iranian politics works. Um, and so they failed to achieve their local objectives of overturning the election results. But I only realized this in talking to activists in Egypt and Tunisia after the fact. And I asked them, where were you during the Green Revolution? And they would talk about watching it on Al Jazeera. They would talk about watching it on BBC and, and CNN and various other media outlets. And they'd only, in the context of their own revolution, realized how much they'd sort of internalized what had happened in Iran. And so I have a theory, and you can certainly challenge it, that the Arab Spring began not in December of 2010 in city Bouzid, Tunisia, but in fact began in June of 2009 in the only non-Arab country in the entire region, which is Iran. So the Iranian people succeeded in putting an idea out there, uh, right? So they didn't, as I mentioned, they did not succeed in achieving their concrete objectives, but they put an idea out there that large numbers of people armed with a mobile device can actually challenge a regime. Now, whether or not they're successful in that is a totally different story, but nobody can refute the fact that there was, in fact, a, a challenge. And this becomes interesting because we learn that, especially when you have a contagion of discontent, um, just because physical individuals are constrained by borders and constrained by some of the challenges they face locally does not mean their ideas are. Um, and nowhere was this more important than in Tunisia. Now, what's important to note about Tunisia is technology had absolutely nothing to do with starting the revolution. It was not organized online in any way, shape, or form. Um, but in Tunisia, technology did several other things. Um, one, it massively accelerated the revolution. So if you look at the picture up there of Mohamed Bouazizi, the, the, the young man who set himself on fire, um, we have this picture. And not only do we have this picture, this picture was flashed all across the Middle East and North Africa. And in, in a part of the world where there's a history of unification, um, a largely shared ethnicity um, and a largely shared religion, um, there are some aspects of what happens in Tunisia, you know, has meaning for somebody in Yemen, has meaning for somebody in Algeria, and the notion of somebody because of high food prices, unemployment, corruption, and regime brutality being so frustrated that he set himself on fire really captured a lot of what young people in the Middle East and North Africa were feeling. And being able to see it made it more real. Um, and so what we realize from the case of Tunisia is that just because revolutions uh, used to start in private doesn't mean, and may still start in private, doesn't mean they won't completely unfold in public in real time. And that's exactly what happened in Tunisia. And so Tunisia became not just a jasmine revolution, but a sort of real-time case study for everybody else in the region watching on what to do and what not to do. Um, so you had all these kind of weak ties that formed online that, um, you know, as the revolution progressed, became stronger. And people that were meeting online sort of halfway through the revolution, you know, started sort of interacting with each other offline. The other important thing that happened uh, is technology put a small country, Tunisia, that most people wouldn't typically pay any attention to, on the map. Um, now, I would argue in the case of Tunisia that uh, connection technologies filled a very important gap that was left by mainstream media. So when the Jasmine Revolution was unfolding, MSNBC was doing a story on a young girl whose leg uh, unfortunately suffered a bite from Martha Stewart's dog, and CNN was interviewing a robot contestant on Jeopardy, uh, who had been on Jeopardy. This is sort of, these were the kind of pressing issues of the time. Um, and, uh, but sort of what social media did and what connection technologies did is it allowed enough momentum to be built to make this a story that the mainstream media eventually covered. Now, once that happened, they needed content. And the content actually came from Tunisians themselves. And so it became this interesting symbiotic relationship where the mainstream media needed the content, the citizens needed the validation, and thus was born a partnership between the mainstream media and the people of, uh, the, the, the people of Tunisia. Um, now, the other piece of this that I think is really important is 
um, technology sort of became this rallying cry, became this identifier. And in part, the, media had, the mainstream media had a lot to do this because I would argue they actually greatly exaggerated the importance of technology in organizing the Tunisian revolution because they came late and because they didn't understand it. And I remember talking to a Tunisian about this during the revolution and you know, asking him if it was exaggerated and, and he sort of laughed at me and went, shh, don't tell anyone that you know, Twitter wasn't used to organize this and you know, social networks weren't used to organize this because they're, the only reason they're covering us is because they think it's a Twitter revolution. So don't tell anybody. Um, and I thought that was very telling. Um, the other piece of this is you know, people often talk about the role that WikiLeaks played um, in, 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 the, in the revolution in Tunisia. And a very funny story, um, I met the guy on a recent trip to Tunisia who actually was responsible for publishing these. And you ask him, you know, why, why did you, you know, you know why did you do this? You know, were, were you trying to let Tunisians know how bad Ben Ali was? I, I didn't need to tell Tunisians how bad Ben Ali was. I needed to tell you how bad Ben Ali was. And so they viewed WikiLeaks in the context of Tunisia um, as a way to make sure the world understood why they were demonstrating. Because Tunisians were very cognizant of the fact that Tunisia was a good security partner for the United States, uh, that the relationship was reasonably cordial, it wasn't sort of a problem country, and they were worried that the world wouldn't understand what it was that they were actually protesting against. Now, I was in Egypt during, uh, when, when, when the, the, the revolution actually started, and so I have, a lot of my perspective comes from, you know, talking to Egyptians on the ground. And what's interesting about Egypt is there were two tools used to organize the revolution in Egypt. One which arrived in Egypt in the seventh century, the mosque, and the other which arrived in Egypt in, uh, you know, sort of the, the, the late 2000s, which is social networks. Um, and those two tools combined were a lot of how this was organized. So it wasn't just you know, sort of leaderless, unlikely leaders doing this. It was a combination of old leaders uh, using rusty tools and you know, sort of you know, new leaders using modern tools with rusty strategies, uh, at least for, for, for the long term. And so you know, combined, they were able to get into the streets. And the, the Egyptians actually advertised their revolution. They picked a date, they picked a time, and they, they, they essentially advertised it. I remember the morning the revolution started, um, I went to go see the pyramids in Giza because I hadn't seen them since I was 10. And I remember coming back from the pyramids, it was late morning, and it was the most bizarre scene. Cairo was completely quiet, and all the security forces were sort of slowly taking their sweet ass time getting out there. And it, like, you just knew, because it had all been advertised, it was the weirdest thing ever. You knew exactly what was going to happen in some form, but it was just sort of gradually playing out before your eyes. And the only sort of comparison I have to an advertised revolution is in 2007 when the rebel groups in Fiji sort of advertised their coup and then rescheduled it because the coup leader's mother-in-law was sick, um, <laughs> which is sort of a bizarre case study. And it's always fun to throw Fiji in there in the context of geopolitics. Um, but the other thing that I observed in Egypt that was so fascinating is um, Everybody seemed to know exactly what to do. There was sort of tear gas everywhere, and they all had these limes that they put in rags or vinegar they put in rags. They had people on the highways throwing water down. They had, it was like very organized and strategic. And you know, there hasn't been a lot of sort of big protests in Egypt under Mubarak. And so you ask them, how, did you, how do you all know what to do? And they said, oh, the Tunisians told us. So they didn't shut down the networks in Egypt until literally the night before. Uh, they had done it sort of intermittently, but they didn't completely shut them down until the night before. So people had access to Twitter and Facebook and YouTube and all these other platforms, and the Tunisians were just sharing best practices. Um, and again, there's enough of a shared identity across you know, the, the, the Arab countries that you know, people's social net, actual social networks extended beyond just their, 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 their home country. And so there was some credibility in where this, informa this information w w was coming from. Um, now, the other interesting thing I saw on the streets of Egypt is you saw these young people capturing content on their phones, and because they couldn't send it out themselves since the networks were down, they'd run it over to Al Jazeera, or they'd run it over to another media outlet. And your assumption is they want to let the world know, right? So you talk to them and ask them that, and they say, no, I'm not trying to let the world know. I'm trying to let Alexandria know. I'm trying to let the guy in the top of the building know. So the only thing that was actually working in the country was satellite television. The only thing that they you know, weren't willing to block, they would sort of, you know, it would be blurry at times, but they, they didn't completely block it. And so Egyptians in Cairo were communicating with Egyptians in Alexandria and other parts of the country as a bank shot off of Al Jazeera and 20 million other people, which is just a fascinating use case for the mainstream media that I had never heard before. Um, now, the other important piece that we learned from Egypt is um, in the aftermath of Iran, everybody said, oh, all regimes have to do is shut down the networks. 
Um, now, part of me feels, you know, sort of like the Iranian situation is very tragic. And when I talk to activists in Iran, they also feel like it was tragic. They said if we had just had, you know, a couple more years to get more people online and have more people with mobile phones, the backlash would have been too great for the regime to do this. It's a country of 72 million people. You know, you know Egypt is a country of, of, you know, 85 million people. And you talk to people on the streets and ask them why they're there, and they say things like, this wasn't my fight, but then Mubarak took away uh, my internet connectivity and he made this relevant to me. You talk to another young person who says, what was I going to do, stay at home on my computer, which didn't work, and use my phone, which didn't work, and sit in my hot room with an air conditioner that doesn't work in a room that I share with several siblings? You know, I'm pretty curious about what's happening outside. So it actually was counterproductive in the case of Egypt, and I will make an argument um, again, you may disagree, that had Mubarak not shut down the networks completely, that he may have been able to hold on to power. That the number of people in the streets naturally was large, but I would argue the number of people in the streets was even larger. And when people don't know what's going on and they know it's a big deal and they can't find out information from their phones and they can't find out information from the internet, the logical sort of next step is to peek outside and see what's happening. And it was kind of unfolding everywhere. Um, and so I think this is a very important lesson going forward for a lot of regimes. Um, now, the other piece of this, you know, I was in Libya and Tunisia recently, and a lot of people you know, asked me in the aftermath, so is this all going well? Right? And, and my response to them is, is technology accelerates you know, the pace at which you can start a revolution, but it may actually create more problems for finishing a revolution. You know, revolutions have always historically been hard to both start um, and finish. Now they're easier to start and I think they're harder to finish because, because they happen so fast, expectations are increased. Um, but also, um, you know, the pace at which the, these revolutions are, 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 are being started, you know, just means they're going to happen more frequently as, as well. Um, but the basic conditions for a successful revolution remain true. You need real leadership, you need real institutions, you need a real strategy, you need a plan to actually rebuild a society. There's a lot of examples throughout history of, of failed revolutions, and I don't believe they're going to get any easier to actually uh, finish just because of, of, of technology. Um, so, What's next? Um, let me continue the theme of, 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 of revolution uh, in, in the context of, of, of the future. Um, so we, we often hear people talk about leaderless revolutions. Uh, the revolutions in the Middle East and North Africa were leader. You, you hear that a lot. Um, I said this to a group of students uh, that I met with right before this, some of who are in the room, which is I believe that the accelerated pace um, of these revolutions and the prevalence of this technology will make it, in some respects, harder for the Mandelas and the De Gaulle's of the like to actually emerge. Um, that it's easy to create a public figure, it's hard to create somebody with the knowledge of what a constitution should look like, what the institutions should look like, um, and you know, given how fast you can become a quote, you know, leader in modern day context, it, for a lot of young people, is less appealing to sort of, you know, go through the motions of becoming, um, you know, a sort of a leader of, you know, sort of the 1989, the 1989 world. Um, you know, Tunisia is an interesting example because they had a lot of political prisoners that are now running the show there. But the most important thing to understand about all of Middle East and North Africa, part of the reason that the Islamist groups are doing so well in these elections is, under dictatorship, they were the most organized elements of society. They could deliver public goods and had a good track record of delivering public goods. And so there's no institutions other than a Ministry of Interior under dictatorship. And so in the absence of that, when a leader falls and there's a power vacuum, the, the, the people who are most equipped to fill that um, are the ones who are the most organized in society. So again, Egypt, that's a, you know, some combination of the SCAF and the Muslim Brotherhood. In Tunisia, it's in Hada. In Libya, we don't really know yet because we, we don't have a good uh, window into that. And so, you know, this is, a, this is a different sort of context than we saw in Eastern Europe, where there was a large number of elites who were well-trained in leadership development, who lived in the country, uh, and so forth. And so things have become much more complicated. So what will actually happen with this? I believe that you know, the revolutions will actually just take a lot longer. You know, a decade from now, you know, some of the people who emerged as, it, it'll be sort of be backwards. It used to be you emerged as a leader and then a public figure. Now you emerge as a public figure and then over the course of several years have to prove that you're a real leader. And many of them won't be able to prove that. Some of them will. And the ones that will are the ones that over time will be able to run for president, win, actually win and deliver. Um, so that's sort of where I see revolutions going. Um, people often ask, you know, do you think there'll be another, you know, will there be like a Latin America spring or an Asia spring? I think there was something very distinct about Middle East and North Africa. And I alluded to some of this before. History of unification, um, you know, reason, relatively shared religion, and most importantly, a shared, largely shared uh, ethnic Arab identity. 
Um, and so people's, as I mentioned before, people's social networks extended from uh, Morocco all the way to, to, to Iraq and into the, into the Gulf. Um, what I do believe is that these revolutions going forward will be more country specific than region specific. There's not a lot of other regions that have the attributes that I just, the three attributes that I just described um, in, the, in the context of the, the Middle East and North Africa. Um, and so I think you have to look at countries, not, not regions. I don't believe that you're gonna see a lot of these you know, sort of big contagions of discontent. I do think you're gonna see revolutions every day. You know, a lot of them will exist online. Um, you know, and I think that you know, regimes in the future will have a tough challenge, which is, the regime of the future is going to have to decide between what they should not overreact to and what they should treat as just online noise and what they should not underreact to because, in fact, it's something online that is brewing into something real that could extend offline. And so that challenge of figuring out what's noise and what's real is what's going to trip regimes up. And where regimes can take sort of a run-of-the-mill online revolution and turn it into something uh, that could potentially be uh, more hazardous will be when they disproportionately react to something that is, in fact, noise. Um, a great example of this is actually Singapore and Curry. Um, it didn't amount to anything, but it's a telling and illustrative example. So several years ago, there was a, uh, a dispute between two uh, people in Singapore who, who lived in the same, uh, on the same hallway in the same apartment complex. And uh, one of them was uh, 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 of, of Chinese descent and one was actually of, of, of uh, Indian descent. And the Singaporean of Indian descent uh, was cooking curry and his Chi in Singaporean of Chinese descent neighbor was complaining about the, the smell of curry and they got into a big fight. And as is often the case in Singapore, they brought in a mediator. And the mediator resolved it, and they sort of worked out certain days will be curry days when that individual is not there. Anyway, that, that part's not interesting. What is interesting is several years later, the mediator went public with the story. And you think to yourself, how could this possibly be interesting? Um, you know, so the mediator went public with the story, and all of these people looking to exploit something online, because in the future, revolutionary triggers will be much easier to, be fi uh, much easier to find, because there's just going to be a lot of sort of uh, uh, online venting. It's just going to be a lot easier. Um, so opportunists took this and used it as an opportunity to uh, sort of push the point that Chinese immigrants are taking the jobs of Singaporeans, and it turned into this huge issue. Protests online, protests offline, and the government was truly, truly scared of this. And everything was fine in the end. But you look at a, a small country like Singapore, you know, very controlled, very organized, very poised, and something like a small dispute over curry caught them more off guard than just about anything that's happened in recent years. You're going to see a lot of that. Um, and you're going to see a lot of regimes manage it well, and you're going to see a lot of regimes not manage it well. Um, so now let's, let's talk a little bit about terrorism. Um, you know, what does the future of terrorism look like? Um, obviously, technology is an equal opportunity enabler. It enables people both for, for good and for ill. So, you know, does that mean there's going to be more terrorists? Does it mean there's going to be less terrorists? Um, I would argue that while the barriers of entry to terrorism may be lower in the future, the risks involved in engaging in terrorism and criminal activity and violent criminal activity will be much larger. So if you think about the last 10 years, we went from bin Laden in a cave to bin Laden in, you know, a mansion in Abbottabad with hard drives and thumb drives and CDs and, you know, various other things. Um, it used to be that, you know, uh, special forces, you know, go into a house and arrest a terrorist leader. Now they arrest a terrorist leader, get their SIM card, and get the entire network. Um, I heard a great story about a top al-Qaeda commander um, who U.S. government had been on the hunt for in Afghanistan for a good, like, almost seven years. Um, and they'd never been able to catch anybody slipping up. And what happened was he had been very careful in his professional role as an al-Qaeda operative. Um, but then had no problem picking up the phone for the first time in seven years to call his friend in Pakistan saying that he was going to attend his wedding. And that's ultimately how they ended up catching him. And so this senior al-Qaeda operative was about 27 years old. So he made sort of a rookie youthful mistake of you know, uh, not realizing that when you're on the run, your social life and your, your, your professional life are pretty intertwined. Um, and so the risks are just going to, be, going to be much greater for people involved in this. And I believe that it will be easier to take down terrorist networks. Um, that being said, you're going to see a diversification of terrorist tactics, right? So, you know, the everyman drone, which we already see today. You can buy it at, at, at toy stores. You know, it's sort of going to be the modern day IED, um, improvised explosive device. Um, you will have a situation where I think in Latin America, you'll see the emergence of virtual kidnapping. So today, kidnapping is very common in Latin America. Most often it's done for ransom, right? I kidnap a physical person. I hold them for ransom to get lots of money. Well. You know, it costs money to hold uh, someone hostage. Um, it's also extremely risky. And you'll see all these very tech-savvy 
uh, you know, uh, terrorist organizations that will essentially hack into people's online profiles, kidnap their identity, and hold their identities hostage in exchange for money. Um, like these are the, the things that you can imagine happening in the future, and so counterterrorism tactics will actually have to change. So then how do we imagine sort of the big terrifying thing that keeps us all up at night, which is, you know, what does a future 9-11 look like? Um, in the technology industry, people talk about things like a, you know, uh, a digital Pearl Harbor or a, you know, a cyber 9-11. I think, you know, in talking to people, conventional wisdom, I think, has led a lot of people to believe that the big catastrophic cyber attack that will kill lots of people is hard to imagine. Now, what I believe is today we see coordinated physical attacks, so triple suicide bombings or quadruple suicide bombings or multiple planes hijacked and flown into buildings. I believe that the future coordinated attack goes something like cyber, physical, cyber. So a cyber attack that is hard to trace and hard to attribute that is designed to make it easier to undertake a physical attack. So you disable, disable certain security systems or something else. Then you know, a physical attack of, of horrific proportions. And then another cyber attack following that or simultaneous to that to make it harder t for a state to react to. So disabling um, you know, alarm systems, disabling a lot of sort of the emergency response uh, tools. That, that to me is the nightmare situation of a multi-dimensional coordinated attack on the cyber and the, and the physical front. So let me wrap up by saying, you know, here's how I, here's how I sort of view the world in, in, in the future. I think you have a virtual world which is dominated by, by, by citizens. You have a physical world which is dominated by states. Ultimately, states are still going to dominate in the international system, but they're going to be kept in check in ways that have never seen before. So sovereignty of states is going to be chipped away at, but it's not going to be totally stripped. Um, it'll, it'll change. It'll have to adapt. Um, but, but, but states will still be in charge, but being in charge will mean something different. So how will states adapt? I would argue that every, every, every government will have two domestic policies and two foreign policies, one for the virtual world, one for the physical world. At times they'll be consistent, at times they'll be actually contradictory to each other. Um, for the citizen, it used to be that if you were a citizen, um, you were responsible for who your physical identity. Now, so much is online, more people will know you and know about you by who you are online than who you are as a physical person. And so online identities will become increasingly important. So today, Egypt has 85 million people. In 10 years, Egypt will have 850 million virtual people, even if the number stays at 85 million. Because just as people today have multiple SIM cards, so too will people in the future have multiple online identities. They'll have their business identity, their social identity, maybe they'll have their rogue identity. They'll sort of have different, you know, every, we'll all have multiple personalities. Um, but as a citizen, your responsibility is, you know, not just as a citizen, but your, your sort of, your identity becomes more of a management project than anything else. And so you can imagine sort of the rise of all new, a whole new realm of insurance. You can imagine, you know, the, the growth of an entire industry that is already starting to pop up around reputation management. These things will only become more important. And, you know, if we all think about, you know, I, I don't know about you guys, I am so glad that I didn't have, uh, an online social networking profile until my junior year of college, uh, when, when, when it first sort of emerged on, on, on the scene. I'm so glad that I'm not a freshman in high school today, you know, just creating a cumulative record of like everything. Um, but I think ultimately what will happen, ultimately what will happen is because these sort of, we're all going to generate these cumulative histories of ourselves, um, you could imagine if we look at juvenile law today, uh, there's a law that says, you know, your, your, your criminal record is, um, is, is anonymous in, 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 you know, before your 18th birthday. I'm not recommending this or suggesting this or um, saying I necessarily even have a position on this, but you could imagine um, a situation where in the future, with everything being time-stamped, it actually being illegal for Princeton University or you know, a company or a sort of housing complex to consider anything online before your 18th birthday in their decision-making process. Um, I don't know if that's possible or not. I'm just sort of throwing that out to be provocative and, and, and suggest that you, can, you know, states are going to have a hard time replicating the laws of the physical world in cyberspace in a way that is perfect. And so cyberspace will, cannot be controlled completely because it's an ungoverned space largely. So states will realize that they'll have to sort of you know, adapt their laws or sort of play around with their laws in the context of cyberspace if they want to um, have it reflected in, in, in the virtual world. And then finally, companies. I, I don't believe there's a, a single technology company in, in, in the future that will, be able, that will be able to be neutral on any issue just because 
all these companies are putting tools out on the public domain that's fundamentally shaping power dynamics between people and states, people and each other, and between states that, that themselves. And so states have, uh, so technology companies have two choices. They can either proactively think about all the issues that they're not, sort of, they don't perceive themselves to be relevant to today, or they can wait in the future to have some intersection with a global challenge and their tools become very pronounced, in which case they would have to react to it, leading them to have to take a position on it. So this will be an interesting thing to watch in the next 10 years is how different technology companies um, you know, sort of adapt to the realities that these tools are going to be relevant to every single challenge in the world, whether they want them to be or not. Um, so finally, my last point is we often talk about the social contract. Uh, as something within a particular country where citizens, you know, keep their government in check and if their government, you know, uh, doesn't perform well, they overthrow it in some way, shape or form. Um, I believe that in the future, that virtual world and that physical world that I talked about will sort of result in a new international system that reflects an equilibrium um, that manifests itself from a global social contract between citizens and their world and states and their world. Ultimately, you know, this, the Westphalian system's fine. Um, you will still, the world is still going to be divided up by states, but on top of that will be this sort of global social contract uh, where all states are grappling with similar issues, all citizens are grappling with uh, certain issues, and as a collective, they keep each other in check in some way, shape, or form. Uh, questions? Let me call on people okay. since I know I have. Um, so we've, got, we've had plenty to think about. Uh, students first, please, uh, since we want to uh, give students a chance to ask some questions, and please keep them to questions. Hi. Um, could you just talk uh, briefly also about Google Ideas, just maybe really briefly? Yeah, of course. Um, so a, a, lot of, a lot of what I'm describing, by the way, is uh, very much part of the intellectual theory of the case behind Google Ideas, this notion that technology is going to be relevant to every challenge we see in the world. Um, the way that I describe Google Ideas is as a think slash do tank. Um, and we focus on all the challenges in the world that don't fall in an obvious philanthropic box and that don't fall in an obvious core business box. So things like weak and failed states, um, uh, we look at illicit networks, so narco networks, you know, organized crime, human trafficking, arms smuggling. Um, we look at uh, radicalization and, and, and terrorism. And the way that we approach these challenges is we try to reframe them in ways that account for technology because we think that the ways in which these tools are making these challenges more complex is understudied, and we think that solutions that involve technology are underexplored. So our goal is to not just think about the challenges through the lens of technology, but then actually go out there in partnership with others to seed projects that prove how, the, prove how technology can be used to, to address them. So for instance, you can imagine a lot of interesting, you know, uh, sort of exploration around transparency and visualization vis-a-vis -vis illicit networks. So we don't, we as a company are not trying to be the ones to fundamentally solve these problems. We're not the, the, the experts, but we understand technological tools very well and where they're going. Um, and what we're trying to do is uh, sort of add our contribution, which is technology expertise, to a larger mix and ecosystem of people that are working on these issues. Yeah, please. You want to come down to the microphone? Yeah. Hi. Hello? Oh. You're good. Um, You're good. <laughs> hi, you seem to be contrasting um, basically citizenship with, with uh, what it means to be a virtual um, person. And um, I'm really interested in that, but I'm also interested in how um, well, you're saying that uh, a person can transcend basically their citizenship and go th across sovereignties through through the virtual world. I'm interested in in how that just applies to social life in general. I mean, I'm, I'm an anthropology major, so we often talk about how um, Real to be... One. <laughs> uh, we often talk about to be a citizen doesn't necessarily mean to confine yourself to um, what the laws uh, identify um, your roles and, and what it means to be human, but um, that, you know, uh, people are constantly reinterpreting what laws um, are telling you how to be like. So, for example, when you were talking about Iran, like it said, uh, the Ra Iranian law said that you can't be doing what you did with the Bluetooth, but people are constantly reinterpreting that and and uh, kind of um, improvising and doing all these different things. So, 
I kind of see what you're saying in contrasting citizenship with, with virtual citizenship, but I think there's something in the middle. So first of all, I think anthropology is incredibly, uh, in the same way I said technology has never been more relevant to international relations, so too do I believe anthropology has never been more relevant to international relations. I think states and citizens are going through a interesting period of turbulence where they're trying to sort of understand who and what they are in the context of this, this, this new and fast changing world. Um, let me give you an example of, of, of how I maybe distinguish the two. So look at a revolutionary context, right? So I think we incorrectly label everybody speaking out online as a cyber dissident. So as a cyber. as a cyber dissident. And I think that's a symptom of the fact that we're sort of all in this euphoric period where we see all these people speaking out online and tweeting out online and posting online um, in countries that we've never seen that before. Um, but there's a real difference. You know, I, think, I think we're going to sort of move past that period eventually and come to the realization that we need to redefine what a dissident is. Everybody can't be a dissident, right? So what makes somebody a dissident as opposed to somebody who's virtually courageous? It's the willingness to put yourself at tremendous physical risk and play and, and do so in the context of a leadership role that the masses you know, aren't necessarily willing to take, but maybe willing to follow. Um, you know, I'm, not, I'm not an expert on sort of the definitions of this. That's, that's my sort of you know, uh, novice attempt to, to, to describe it. But I think there is a, a, a difference there. So I think there's actually three options. You know, so you have a real dissident who will also, you know, who will be online and in the, you know, doing things in the physical world, a virtually courageous citizen who won't be the first person in the street, but maybe the 10th person in the street, um, won't be in the front of the line, but maybe will be in the middle of the line. Um, and then you have a whole other category after that, which is just, you know, the virtual act, you know, the sort of the virtual commentator or whatever, the person that never crosses into the physical world. Um, and then you have a whole other category, um, you know, of around the world, you have these transnational meddlers, you know, people building things in one country for people in another country. You have virtual, you know, you're you sort of like revolutionary tourists who are these people who literally spend all day online, like tweeting and retweeting things that are happening in various revolutions without knowing anything about who they're retweeting and what they're retweeting. So the cast of characters in this context is large. Um, and diverse, and it's a great project actually for an anthropology student to actually look at, to take a revolution uh, in the new digital age and break down the different sort of layers of citizenry in the context of sort of trying to redefine dissent and redefine activism. So that leads me to ask a question. I wrote an article called Design Your Own Profession that basically talked about taking apart traditional professions. So obviously journalism becomes crowdsourcing, fact-finding, curating, aggregating. I wonder if you would talk a little bit about future professions that you see emerging, perhaps particularly uh, for this crowd. Yeah, this is actually one of my favorite questions. And actually, this was it not was staged. Not it, was, it, was not, it was not staged, although no, it, it looks bad, but it, it, wasn't, it wasn't staged. Um, the, one of the messages I always give when I, when I talk to students, um, and I'd be curious any of your reactions to this, which is um, because you all grew up with these tools in a way that even me, just being probably a few years older than a lot of you, didn't. Uh, I didn't really start using a lot of it until, in, until college. You probably started using it in, in, in high school. Um, you, know, you don't look at your knowledge of technology as an expertise. Yeah. You, you totally take it for granted. You all totally waste it, probably, with a few exceptions. Um, and what I mean by that is it's second nature to you. So when you go into an internship or you go into a job, um, you absolutely are crazy if you're not sort of branding yourself as the person who also understands these tools. Most, most people, when they go into a work environment, find a hierarchical structure that lends itself towards older, people of an older generation being in charge. And so talk about a great way to add value and make yourself relevant to people you know, sort of several notches up the food chain. Uh, but also, it, it's, you know, it's a unique added value that you can bring to the table on a set of issues that people have been studying for a long time. So take you know, the Arab-Israeli conflict. I, in, in our short lives as young people, we're not going to become as big, you know, big of experts right now as people that have been studying the conflict for 20 years. Same thing with China. Same thing with, you know, sort of a lot of issues out there. But, you know, the unique twist of technology is actually a point of entry into these topics that are massively studied um, that allow for unique and original insight. And so whatever you do, if you're not making technology part of it, then it is a huge, huge missed opportunity and you're underselling yourself. Go ahead. You use some very graphic examples of the impact of technology in the Arab Spring or the picture of the young woman shot in Iran. 
And now we're seeing absolutely gruesome shots coming out of Syria day after day after day. Thousands of people are being killed. Is that message resonating uh, in the Arab world? And much less, is it resonating anywhere in Washington? It's a good question, and it's hard not, I mean, you're, the number reached over 10,000 in the last couple of days. You know, it's, and I remember I talked to uh, a couple activists in, in, in Syria uh, a few days after this all started. Remember, Syria actually ha was one of the very early ones to get started. Um, and I made an analogy, to, I, I drew an analogy to this could be the next Hama, right? In Hama in 1982, uh, Hafez al-Assad, Bashar's father, killed 20,000 people in three days. And all these people jumped on me, like how, like how dare you, this is so not Hama at all, this is totally different, but now we're up to over 10,000 people killed. And it may not be in the span of three days, it may be in the span of a year, but this isn't stopping anytime soon. Um, and so there's a couple of observations. I don't have a perfect answer for you. Um, you know, I have to believe people are thinking about it. There's a lot of challenges, right? Why Libya, but why not? Uh, Syria, right? Syria is of tremendous geopolitical importance. It's certainly more complicated. You have uh, the, the the Russian government is you know heavily financially in, uh, invested in, in in this regime, which has created challenges at the Security Council. Um, you know the the Chinese are in a, a, to a lesser extent the same situation as, as Russia, but not not far off. Um, well, it, it's I, I don't actually think it's 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 necessary necessarily about oil. I think part of it has to do with timing. Right? I mean, the, the, the time, one, one thing that's interesting, when you have an entire region swept with revolutions, um, timing actually matters a lot, right? When did Iran happen, you know, in 2009? When did, you know, Libya happen versus, you know, Syria going really, really bad? Um, you know, when did Tunisia happen? When did, all, the timing of these, every activist in the region will tell you that the timing of each of these things matters vis-a-vis -vis all, all the others. What's interesting about the content coming out of Syria, though, is, I mean, I, 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 there's a lot of sort of activists that I know pretty well in Syria who send me these you know, horrific, horrific videos coming out. And they have like 32 views, 100. The worst videos that I see in terms of like illustrative imagery coming out of Syria are the ones with the least number of views. And so what you learn from this is that um, the people, you know, so we're at a stage now where people can actually uh, document their evidence in real time and push it out. But what you realize is that when people are besieged by a, re a regime that's brutalizing them, um, you know, part of the training for this kind of civil society activism has to sort of lend itself towards some form of civic marketing um, so that people can not just document the evidence but also get it out. Um, to me, that's already one of the important lessons from Syria. Um, I don't know what, what will happen. I have to believe something, um, uh, you know, I have to believe something will change. This is the first time in a year that I'm starting to question whether or not he might actually be able to hold on. Um, uh, which I, I, I would have absolutely rejected, you know, three or four weeks ago. But um, the regime has proven able to uh, get away with this with, with, with very little backlash. Can I, I'm going to add a word on Syria. Uh, it, that and also much more social support, right? I mean, if you compare this to Libya, uh, Gaddafi had some support, but uh, Assad really does have support, and he has support uh, in the business class and among among minorities. Uh, and uh, I, I, I agree, actually, that I think what we're seeing is that the more evidence we get, the less powerful it's becoming. And I've noticed exactly that, that the NIDA uh, the the Nita video was, had such a huge impact, but if you see that every every day, much less. My question, actually, to you, Jared, is whether you can imagine our being able to shut down the internet. If could we use cyber tools, for instance, to shut down the internet for everybody in Damascus, for, for people, uh, so that it would actually affect the people right now who are not being affected. Because I don't think there's going to be any kind of, I don't see right now any kind of physical military intervention. I just wonder if you've thought about other kinds. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with that. Sort of like a, a, a you know, internet no-fly zone of sorts, yeah. right? It, it's, um, so it's, it's, it's interesting. When I, I was in Libya a couple months ago and I met with some of the, the rebels who are now in charge, and they told me something totally fascinating, um, which is, uh, so they started, and it's, uh, there's, there's a lot of reasons this is more complicated in Syria, but the advantage in Libya was the revolution started from the east, and so they actually were able to get to Benghazi over land without any problem from another, from another country. Um, and so what happened is all of the, they literally, they, they kept, I was with the chairman of our company, and they kept asking us if we knew Fred, just some guy named Fred, and we're like, who's, who's Fred? They said, oh, he's this American guy who came over on these wooden canoes 
um, and brought us all of these sort of like boxes and technologies and VSATs and helped us disconnect from Gaddafi's network. So what happened was Fred and, and, and Fred's friends, um, they worked with the Libyan rebels to literally sever the ties between their telecommunications and their internet and the Gaddafi internet, which was, so they actually had to, you had, they had to break it before they could rebuild it. Um, so I think that will be the first step that will happen. Now the problem in Syria is, you know, Homs is kind of ground zero for this and there's no, it, it's, it's landlocked by, you know, Syria itself. So there's no way to get to homes. And so in the future, I could imagine almost like a Berlin airlift type situation where this happens, but not, not right now. Um, so you have a challenge where, you know, there's no, it's really, they're in the heart of the country and there's no way to get things there um, to them. Um, and so the equivalent of Fred can't sort of show up in a canoe and help them figure out how to disconnect the, the, the networks. Um, and so that, that, that's sort of how I, that, that's a huge challenge in, in, in Syria. So they have to use you know, they have to use the enemy network in order to actually get content out, which is, uh, and I also think it's worth noting that, you know, if this happened in Syria, you know, in five years, it would also look different than today. There's content coming out, but there's not a barrage of content coming out. There, there's, there's content coming out, but a lot of it is like upside down and you can't really see it as much and you can't hear it. And there, there's just, you know, the world is going to get, the, the sort of the human rights organization of the future is a curator of this stuff in a way uh, that, that sort of, helps address the reality that you do see diminishing returns. At the end of the day, when you see so much of this, a poorly produced raw video that's fuzzy and loud and long, um, you know, the, the general public doesn't have the same sort of, you know, uh, you know, ability to, 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 to watch many, many, many of these. And so you're gonna have to see, you're gonna see sort of a whole new realm of civil society that emerges just around this, um, you know, as, as, as curators to help, you know, people with the right content, you know, produce the content in the right way such that it gets out and people actually see it. So thinking about the technology enabled revolutions that you reviewed, do you perceive that technology also accelerates the factionalization post-crisis, and where's the opportunity for statecraft in, in that type of post-crisis post uh, environment? Yeah, no, actually, this is what I was emailing you about, about yesterday that I told you to remind me to, 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 to bring up, so this is, the perfect, this is the perfect opportunity. So I've been thinking a lot lately about, like, you know, is there a future Marshall Plan for, you know, the sort of, the, the new, for, for the post-conflict uh, scenario in the new digital age? And, you know, I, in, in, in our book, we're trying to sort of play around with this, and we spent weeks and weeks and weeks kind of trying to grapple, and we, and we realized it's not, there won't be a grand Marshall Plan for something like this. Um, what you'll have is almost more of like a prototype for how you do post-conflict reconstruction in a new digital age. And so, you know, you'll have a community, technology will be so central, you know, and, and when I say prototype, I mean like a, a set of sort of features and tools and approaches that are adapted depending on the society. And I think the first piece of that is a, a communications first approach, that, that technology will become so essential to how a society functions, how, you know, rule of law is preserved, how uh, economies continue, that um, getting telecommunications up and back up and running um, and upgraded and sort of not tainted by the sort of weird autocratic things that are put into it is going to be an immediate priority. Um, you're going to see telecom companies, therefore, in a lot of cases, playing a leadership role, either as coalition partners or as nationalized entities for a period of time. But I also think one of the most interesting pieces of this is I think almost every society in the future is going to be backed up by virtual institutions. And so you won't ever in the future have to start from scratch again. So this, notion, this point that I made before about how you know, the dictators fell and there were no institutions, um, you know, societies will understand the importance of continuing these institutions and because technology will be so central to them, they will you know, exist virtually and physically um, such that even in a moment of horrific, tremendous crisis, um, salaries will still be paid. Pensions will still be provided. Police will still receive uh, their, their, their money. Certain public goods will still be delivered. Universities, even if they're blown up, can still exist online. You know, this is sort of, you know, we're talking 10, year, 10 years out. And, and, and so, so it, it, at least, or at least for, for some societies. But you can imagine sort of, so think about, you know, a post-conflict reconstruction effort in the context where everything is backed up and how it might look different. <laughs> Several months ago, Dean Slaughter talked to us about the sources of power 
and leadership. And I asked the question then, uh, at that time, Occupy Wall Street was hot. And I asked, will a leadership, it's, it's leaderless, and will a leadership emerge? It hasn't. Mm. Syria is a much more, don't quite know how to the right word here, but the opposition is leaderless. How can this technology, which is a tool, help create leadership, which is a, a human kind of quality? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I wish I could say there's some technological tool that I could snap my fingers and, and you know, my, you know, the, all the sort of attributes of, you know, leadership that are required for, you know, a future president of, of a country can just be transferred from, you know, this database to you or you. Um, but that, that's, that's not, that's not going to happen. So I'll make a couple observations. One, if leaders exist, it's going to be easier to find them in a crowd. Um, you know, so, so it's not just going to be, you know, if not every leader comes from the elite class. And so, you know, the people who typically wouldn't get the exposure are now getting the exposure. Two, you can identify the people with potential to become leaders. So I can't remember if I said this in my talk or if I said it to some of the students before, but you, you can imagine, you know, leadership training organizations, whether it's NGOs or institutions or even part of, you know, a new way of thinking about leadership development in the context of foreign assistance. Um, you can imagine people literally going through the tapes. Um, going through all the video and seeing who has potential and who's worth betting on. It's really not that different from what happens now. You know, embassies go to universities and figure out you know, which students are promising, and we bring them on exchanges to the United States and hope that they'll one day become president of their country and like the United States. Right? I mean, it's, it's, it's like a much more modern, you know, I think, an interesting version of, of, of that. Um, the other piece of this that, that I, I do believe is I, there's just going to be more access to information. Um, and there's going to be access to information in a lot of different languages. And so, um, you know, one, one way to think about this is, you know, a lot of people who emerged as leaders in 1989 studied, you know, revolutions in Europe from, you know, 1848. You know, and, and, you know, Mandela often talks about when he was in prison studying, you know, various revolutions and so forth. And, you know, you'll have more documentation of what's happening now than at any other time in history. And you'll have documentation in every language in, in, in the world. Um, and so the case studies will be infinite. And it won't just be case studies of, you know, you know, Lech Walesa when he was, you know, 23 or 24 years old. It'll be the case study of the bread keeper, you know, the, the bread shop owner, or the person in the window, or the, you know, the person who threw water down from, from the highway into Tahrir Square, or the, you know, you know, the, the, the person who was passing out rags, you know, for the, for the tear gas. Right? You'll have all of this. And so, you know, the abundance of case studies, uh, more readily available information about uh, sort of reform and, 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 and um, institutions and so forth. All of this will combine, I think, to you know, create a better ecosystem for training leaders, but I still think it takes time. You know, how many of these leaders had to fail so many times before they finally were able to emerge? It's why you sort of have these tragedies of some of the greatest leaders in the world don't get a chance to really actually be in charge and transform their country until they're like 80 years old. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we've got time for two more questions. There's here and here. And if I could ask everybody else just to keep your seats until 6 o'clock. We're, we're almost done, but it's very distracting to have people sort of drift out. Go ahead. So I would like to get your thoughts on another case study. Last night I got a link about Coney 2012. Have you seen this video? So I'm embarrassed to say I've gotten three emails today asking me if I've about seen it. it, but I haven't actually seen it yet. What so that's video? unfortunate. Uh, it's a video that's essentially been made by a regular Joe who's a doc uh, he well he makes documentaries and it's specifically about Kony who's a leader of the LRA in Uganda and it's calling for a revolution everywhere in the world and I got emails from my teenage brother uh, from my friends in Puerto Rico Puerto Rico it's all getting together they don't get together for their own issues and they're getting together for this and so and it's all because of a video that it's so emotionally compelling but my question is is this noise or, wow. you know, are, it's mostly outside of Uganda that all of this is happening. So it's, it's just a very interesting case study. No, it's, I, don't know, I don't know the answer to whether it's noise. I guess we'll find out, right? I mean, it's, what's interesting about the Lord's Resistance Army, though, is um, it, it's, it, I'm, I'm not downplaying the, the, the horrific nature of the Lord's Resistance Army. It's a terrible, terrible organization. Um, but it's one small organization in one part of the world that, 
has a disproportionate amount of interest on college campuses in the US and, and in Europe. And part of that is because there's an organization called Invisible Children, which very much to their credit has used the power of video to generate a lot of interest. And so whether it's related to this or not, it's very interesting that yet again, video has proven, you know, well-produced video has you know, proven useful for getting people around the world interested in this like seemingly random but, but horrific uh, uh, sort of conflict in, in northern Uganda. I kind of have a question about the, the role of technology in terms of just the U.S. government because there's been a lot of backlash with SOPA, ACTA, the anonymous being labeled a terrorist group, WikiLeaks and such forth that it seems like there's, like you were saying in Iran, there's the younger generation is against any form of the government stepping in with the internet. What role do you think the government should take or what role do you see the government taking in the future with the internet? and type this whole second set of citizenship or global or like social contract that you have as a, a internet citizen, I guess. I mean, I think they're, they're trying to figure it out. And there's a lot, I think, I think every, every arm of the government is gonna have to think of the Supreme Court's gonna get a bunch of really interesting decisions, I would imagine, in the next 10 years. You know, the executive branch, the legislative, every, every branch of government is gonna have, is going to have to make sense of all this. Um, the same way every company is going, the same way every citizen is going to. You know, I mentioned it, it truly is an interesting identity crisis for, for everybody. Um, and I say identity crisis in the sense that it does cause us to sort of all redefine what is our role, um, what is the same, what is not the same, you know, what is just noise, what is real. I mean, th there's just sort of a lot of unanswered questions. I don't have a perfect answer for you. You know, what happened around SOPA and, and, and PIPA was certainly interesting, right? I mean, I, I think there's a lot of, it, it became a very sort of big deal and a very, the, the discourse was, was, was much louder than, 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 people, uh, than, than people expected. Um, but it, it, it's, you know, in the next 10 years, you know, there's gonna be so many interesting uh, data points and case studies from, you know, domestic policy to foreign policy. Um, the only answer I can give you, it's, it's again, yet another really interesting thesis to write. Um, you know, th there's, there's no clear prediction on, on what government should do because I don't think any of us, you know, sort of necessarily know exactly, um, you know, how certain leaders are gonna adapt to these changes. It's gonna be, uh, you know, we're, we're gonna see it sort of as it, as it unfolds. Last question. All right. Thank you. Um, you talked about hijacking identities. Um, if you can do that, and you talked about leaders, um, during a chaos or fog of revolution or war, um, certainly you could create identities and create leaders that don't physically exist and use social media as a weapon in that way to shape the battlefield toward um, uh, national policy of a, of a government which is not even in the region. Yes, that's a, that's a great point. Um, you know, it, it, it's, uh, it, it, the closest example you see, to the, first of all, I'm sure you see sort of examples of this already, we just haven't heard of them. It, it's, it's hard to imagine you don't see examples of this. Um, it, it's the closest thing you see to it today in a way that you do notice is you know, sort of a new version of martyrdom. Um, so in Egypt, you know, Khalid Saeed, who, who was dead, um, you know, his identity, you know, was sort of created in the form of pages and various, other, so he was sort of, you know, it's the closest example of it today. But, but you're, you're absolutely right, so it's an excellent point. I, you can add the Twitter feeds, remember the not Henry Kissinger, there are all these Twitter yeah, feeds that are not. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there, there's, there's all the, the, the there, there's, it, it's not, at least today, uh, there's lots of ways that somebody can create a, an online social networking profile, a Twitter handle. Um, at a certain point, maybe it will become such an issue that there's adaptation, but at least in today's world, um, what you're describing is exactly possible. Um, you could even imagine in a democratic society with a really bad, if there's a, you know, a democratic society somewhere in the you know, developing world where there's a really, um, you know, things have gotten really bad, government makes a really bad decision, you could imagine somebody who doesn't want to you know, be held accountable for something deciding that they're going to organize a nationwide strike where you know, nobody goes to work until the government agrees to step down before its elections and hold you know, uh, sort of a provisional election. You know, it, it's, 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 Hard to imagine, but not impossible to imagine. So, Jared, I assume you have people working for you at Google Ideas, but you really don't need any. Uh, you are a one-person idea uh, factory, um, and you've given us so much to think about, uh, really. It's, it's been uh, challenging, informative, uh, and just very lively and a wonderful speech. So thank you so much. Thanks for having me.